Doing donuts in the parking lot is fun, but it might not be a good idea, and we'll get back to that later. In today's episode, we'll continue tuning the Kian CVK carburetor on this 670cc Predator-powered 1969 Renault R10. And we'll look at some other stuff too, so let's get started. Now in the last episode, we spent a lot of time trying to get the key and CVK carburetor and the fuel pump and the throttle linkage to fit on the 670cc Predator engine. And we didn't have a lot of time to tune the carburetor. Well, the car definitely ran great, but performance was a bit lackluster. In the 0 to 55 mile per hour acceleration test, we were expecting to match or beat our high water mark of 31.03 seconds. Instead, we managed to go quite a bit slower. Meh, this was to be expected. Even though the car ran great, the air-fuel ratio was not ideal for making power. And as you can see right here, at the end of the acceleration test, the air-fuel ratio was 15.85 to 1. Yikes! That's not good for an air-cooled engine. We really want to see in the mid to high 12s on this engine. And that's because air-cooled engines do like to run a bit on the rich side. So I got a lot of comments and advice, and of course I always love comments, even the snarky ones. Anyway, a lot of you folks were saying that before I do anything, I need to add an air filtration system because that affects the way the carburetor works. Well, my bad. You see, we did in fact have an air filtration system in place, we just didn't film it. Actually, we did film it, but it never made it to the final cut, so I blame the guy that edits these videos. Hmm... Anyway, like I mentioned earlier, we spent most of our time last week getting the carburetor, the fuel system, and the throttle to work reliably, and we didn't spend a lot of time tuning. Now, I did get a lot of advice from the comments section, and unfortunately, there was conflicting ideas which is not unusual for YouTube. Now, keep in mind, one of the points I was really trying to make in the last video was, even though the engine ran great, there was a lot more we had to do. So as far as the advice goes, unfortunately, I had to ignore all the advice about the air filter because, well, we had one in place. You folks just didn't get to see it because the way the video was edited. Now, I did learn a thing or two from the comments, and I was able to verify that I didn't completely understand how the pilot jet worked on this carburetor. So this crudely illustrated diagram that I generated in a previous video, well, it's not the scale and it's not 100% accurate. What it does show is we have a perfect mixture at idle and then at part throttle the mixture goes rich and as the car accelerates the mixture goes lean. So we can rule out the air filter and the fuel pump system because we do in fact have an air filter and the fuel pump is providing plenty of fuel. We've already checked that out off camera with various experiments. So let's talk about the pilot jet. Right here we have a good mixture at idle and that's due to the idle mixture screw being properly adjusted. And as I understand it, this fuel is being provided by the pilot jet. Now at part throttle when we go rich, this is apparently fuel that's also being provided by the pilot jet. Now this dip in the air fuel ratio will definitely hurt the fuel economy, but on the acceleration test, this is a mere blip in the air fuel ratio at wide open throttle. So before we go any further, I'd like to remind you that we're using a wide band air fuel gauge to measure measure all this stuff. Now in the real world, most motorcycle carburetor tuning device is not based on the actual air fuel ratio. If you go down that rabbit hole and dig deep into the internet, the advice that's given is all about throttle response and how the bike pulls at wide open throttle. Nowhere will you find actual air fuel ratios. But since we have the wideband gauge, we can try our best to get the carburetor to generate an ideal fuel curve across the power band. And since this is an air-cooled engine, we're going to try to run slightly richer than what you'd expect on a liquid-cooled engine with fuel injection. Anyway, back to the diagram. This brand new $35 carburetor that we're using is not really a key-in carburetor. I believe it's what they call a knockoff. The good news is it uses key-in jets and for the most part it looks like a key-in carburetor. Now just on a side note, I really do think you get quite a bit for $35, bucks, but is it going to be perfect? Well, maybe not. Let's look at another cartoon from last week's video. Yep, this one ain't perfect and we'll need to update it a bit. There we go. Now it shows the main jet, the needle jet, the Venturi and the pilot jet circuit. So on this pilot jet circuit, the fuel supply for the idling engine is provided by this hole and the fuel is regulated by this adjustment screw. So at idle, we can adjust the screw for a nice steady idle. Now because we have the wideband gauge, we can actually adjust the idle mixture exactly where we want it. Normally this adjustment is done by ear. So as I understand it, when the throttle butterfly opens, it uncovers an orifice in the carburetor and the pilot jet will supply additional fuel and the more the throttle is open, the more fuel is supplied by the pilot jet on this CVK carburetor. 
So this dip in the air fuel ratio is being caused by the pilot jet. Now that info is according to some of the comments I got and I verified it with various Kian documents. Now remember, this is a $35 carburetor, so it may not be perfect. Let's take a look at the pilot jet. Now, this is the bottom of the carburetor, and over here is the idle mixture screw. Let's remove the float chamber and take a better look. So this is the pilot jet, and it's responsible for this dip here. Now, the jet that came with the carburetor was a .50 millimeter, and we tried a number of different smaller jets, and finally settled on the smallest we could find, and that's a .32 millimeter. Eh. It's hard to say what effect this had on the dip because no matter what we did, the dip more or less stayed the same. Perhaps something smaller than a .32 would work, but that's not something easily available on short notice here in rural Kansas. Now also keep in mind, there might be something going on with this $35 carburetor that prevents the smaller pilot jet from making a difference. For now, we're going to call it good and let's work on the lean condition at this end of the chart. So the easy and simple way to get some extra fuel at wide open throttle is to raise the needle jet. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's also important, like the taper of the needle jet and the size of the holes in the emulsion tube. Of course, there's always the size of the main jet to consider. Now I have to tell you, this carburetor has been apart no less than 25 times in the last few days. And off camera, we've done dozens of acceleration tests in order to evaluate each modification. Long story short, we tried three different needle jets and emulsion tubes. However, the one that came with the carburetor seems to work the best. Now for the main jet, we had to open it up from 1.3 millimeters to 1.65 millimeters, which seems like a lot. We also experimented with the tension on the depression spring. So after a few days of fiddling with the carburetor, here's what we settled on. The pilot jet remains at 0.32 millimeter and the main jet is custom drilled to 1.65 millimeter. The needle jet was raised to its maximum setting and we trimmed about an inch or 25 millimeter from the depression spring. So now the engine still has a fantastic idle, the throttle response is sharp and we get excellent pulling power at wide open throttle. Now that's motorcycle talk. In other words, we were able to keep the air fuel ratio at or near the target at wide open throttle and of course we still have an issue with the engine running rich at part throttle. On a side note, the various needle jets and emulsion tubes that we tried didn't provide the results we were looking for. At this point, we're ready to film the acceleration test. However, it's midday and the lighting is not ideal for shooting video inside the car. So we decided to do other stuff instead. Before we take the car out for a test drive this evening, well, I think it's time we figure out how much it actually weighs. Now, in the literature that was published back in 1969, they indicated the car weighed 1,746 pounds or thereabouts. Now, with the 670cc Predator engine swap and a full tank of fuel, the car tips the scales at 1,580 pounds, and that works out to be a difference of 166 pounds. Not much, but keep in mind this car is still mostly intact, and most of the difference is from the different engine, and since the new engine is air-cooled, we were also able to get rid of the old cooling system. Now our 420cc fuel-injected supercharged Big Block Honda Insight tips the scales at a mere 1,480 pounds. Now the Honda is significantly lighter, and that's partly due to the fact that the car is made almost entirely of aluminum and plastic. The only steel in the car is the suspension and the fabricated engine cradle. Not only is the Honda lightweight, it's also very aerodynamic. Now I know I'm asking a lot, but remember this bit about the Honda because we'll get back to it later in this video. So if you can, remember lightweight and aerodynamic. All right, let's get back to the Renault. So later that evening, I set out to film the acceleration test. And as you can see, the lighting inside the car is perfect for capturing the speedometer and the data from the wideband gauge. Uh-oh, red flag, red flag. I'll be quiet and we can watch this play out.
Well, this ain't good. And now the phone call. Yep, that belt is destroyed. This car ain't going nowhere at this point. So with nothing to do but wait for my brother Duke to arrive, I thought about what could possibly cause this belt to fail in such a catastrophic way. Hmm. Maybe that wasn't a good idea. So being stuck on the side of the road here in rural Kansas ain't that bad. A gentleman by the name of Luke stopped and offered to help. Actually, he even offered to tow the little car back into town. But since my brother was already on the way, well, that wasn't necessary. But it was greatly appreciated. A short while later, a nice lady stopped and chatted for a while. She said the car reminded her of Mr. Magoo. Yep, yeah, I guess I can see the resemblance. You know, all in all, this breakdown was a pleasant experience, if that's even possible. At this point, the sun was setting fast and my brother Duke had arrived, and the little car was being hauled back into town. It was a quiet ride. Fast forward to the next day, and it looks like all Mr. Magoo needs is a new CVT drive belt. The good news is, we keep a spare belt in stock. The bad news is, the spare belt is one size too big. Now, I have to blame the guy who orders the parts for these projects, because he really screwed up. Oh, don't worry, I didn't forget about the Honda. We'll get back to that in a minute. So, how fast is this car? Well, we really don't know. Now don't worry, we do have an idea. You see, we video almost every acceleration test in order to analyze the data. And we just so happen to have a video of a test we did earlier in the day. Now a few things. At this point, we were still making modifications to the carburetor. And after this video was shot, we made two or three more modifications. So this test ain't close to the actual performance, but it'll show you we were on the right track. Since this short video was never intended to be used for our production, well, the lighting is terrible and the sound equipment wasn't even on. But it's the only thing we got right now. The time to beat is 31.03 seconds. So we're only a half second away from matching the performance of the stock carburetor, but keep in mind we made two or three more additional modifications after this video was shot, so who knows. The new belts have been ordered and we'll find out just how fast this 670cc Predator powered Renault really is, but not today. So let's talk about the Honda. So if you recall earlier in the video, I mentioned that this Honda was lightweight and aerodynamic, and that's exactly why we purchased the car a few years ago. Now in the past, we've powered this car with a tiny 212cc engine, and then moved on to a 420cc engine, and then added fuel injection, a stupid charger, an intercooler, and perhaps more. I don't really remember. Anyway, somehow a 719cc three-cylinder Kubota diesel engine found its way under the hood of this rare little car. And if you watched all our Saturn experiments, well, this little diesel engine got the Saturn up to 60 miles per hour in a hurry once we added a turbocharger. And with the right tuning, the Saturn managed to get 80 miles to the gallon on the back roads here in rural Kansas. Now, for the most part, the Saturn was a pig. It weighed 2,046 pounds, and it wasn't very aerodynamic. So I'm pretty excited to test this tiny diesel engine in a lighter and more aerodynamic car. Now, there's definitely more to this project than an engine transplant. We're also going to be electronically managing the fuel rack, and that'll clean up the exhaust a little bit. And we have a few additional surprises that we'll share when the time is right. Anyway, this project's going on full speed in the background, and we hope to bring you folks on board soon. Now, this semi-vintage Honda is over 20 years old, 
and they didn't make very many of them. I think over the six year production run, only 16,000 of these cars were ever produced before they moved on to the second generation Insight. This first generation Insight is all aluminum and it was built in the same assembly plan as the Honda S2000. And I believe the only part shared between the S2000 and the Insight is the steering wheel. So our new diesel project has at least one good part in it and maybe we can add a few more. Well, once again, I had fun and I hope you did as well. Next time around, we'll find out if the Renault is faster or slower, and we'll be installing a custom engineered part that one of our subscribers designed for this project. <laughs> it should be a hoot. Until next time.